Good evening, church family. Good evening, good evening, church family. Welcome. About to get started shortly. Bear with us while we still get everything set up. We'll be getting started here in about, about two minutes. to go now all right so we want to start tonight of course with prayer as we always do I uh, want to always be in prayer for people so let us go ahead and pray right now father God we come to you right now just saying thank you Lord for another day we want to thank you for being with us thank you for letting us make it to this point of the week God we just want to ask right now that those that are mourning on this week, Father God, those that are struggling to get through this week, Lord, those that are trying to figure out what they're going to do about finances, about health, about family, God, I just ask that you just come and grant them peace in their life, Father God, begin to work things out for them, Father. We want to ask a special prayer for our sister Zara, for Mother Sheila, for Mother Frida, Brother Anthony, and all of the others that we have listed on our prayer list, Father. These are our new additions, God. And we just ask that you just be with them in thine own way, Father. Whatever it is they're going through, God, you already know, Lord. So just make a way in their lives, Father, God. I'm going to pray for our community, God. There's so much going on right here just in the city of Dallas. And one thing I know, Father, God, is that when evil is present, you can change things around. You can protect us in the midst of the lion's den. You can cover us and shield us from all of this nonsense and violence, God. So, Lord, we're just asking for protection, Lord, as we go to and fro. Asking to heal our city, Father God. Lord, change the mind, Lord. Help us as Christians, as believers, to be instruments to make people see that there is a better life there are better decisions there are a, it is a better way to live god just help us through this time bless us tonight as we receive your word and study your word it's in jesus name we pray amen amen hey sister Thompson, i had a hard time getting on too don't feel bad <laughs> amen it's good to see y'all though so we are in the book of luke tonight and we're going to get through, I believe we'll get all the way to chapter 11, which will leave us um, about uh, three or four chapters that we'll end up reviewing as far as uh, Luke's uniqueness. And then we'll get into um, we'll get into next week's, um, well, not next week, it'll be Thanksgiving. The week after that, we'll get into John introduction and we'll finish off with Luke. So, uh, hey, Sister Harper. Hey, Sister Ford. How y'all doing? I'm glad to have you with us tonight. So we're in the book of Luke. So what we've been doing is this overview of the New Testament. So when we're doing this survey of the New Testament or overview of the New Testament, we're going through each book, reading the Bible together as a congregation. So we're now in the book of Luke. Uh, typically, the way we've set this up is we have set it up to go through the who, what, when, where, and why initially. And then we get into understanding what's different about this book. So we've looked at Matthew, we've looked at Mark, and now we're in Luke. All three of these Gospels are called Synoptic Gospels, meaning that 
they are basically containing the same thing. They're all together and they they have some differences, but they're 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 closely related. So tonight we're looking at the unique thing. So what's different about Luke's writing? What's different about um, his text, what he's pictured and what he's wrote down compared to that of Matthew and of Mark. So let's get into it. Now, uh, the differences in Luke, the first difference that we'll notice in Luke compared to the other synoptic gospels is that Luke is the only gospel that explicitly states his purpose. If we go to Luke chapter one, uh, verse number one through four, called the prologue of Luke, if you go there, he actually talks about why he's writing this. He says, many have undertaken to draw up on an account of the things that have been fulfilled among us, just as they were handed down to us by those who from the first were our witnesses and servants of the word. With this in mind, since I myself have carefully investigated everything from the beginning, I too decided to write an orderly account for you, most excellent Theophilus. And then here's the point why he write. This is why he write. He says, so that you may know the certainly, I mean, the certainty of things you have been taught. So he explicitly states why he's writing. Everybody else, we have to go and try to imply why they're writing. But Luke writes, Luke writes his purpose early on in the text to outline why he's writing. He's writing to Theophilus, who was a recent convert. He's trying to tell him, hey, listen, I'm writing so everything that I've told you, you have strength in, uh, you have strength in your beliefs. So that's the very first thing. So the first unique part is the purpose. No other gospel points out their purpose of writing but Luke. So when we fast forward, Luke also gives us this picture that none of the other gospel captures. Luke provides more details on John the Baptist. So the other gospels talk about John the Baptist, but Luke gives us the most information when it comes to John the Baptist. The first chapter is devoted to telling the story of the early years of John the Baptist. It is here that we see this story of his birth being foretold to Zechariah and Jesus' birth being foretold to Mary. So this established their connection from their birth as blood relatives. Luke also uses this story to emphasize the work of the Holy Spirit. And let me show you how he does that. So he talks about John the Baptist saying that the Spirit had been on him since he was in the womb. So it's talking about since he's in his mother's womb, the Holy Spirit has been on John the Baptist. Luke emphasizes the work of the Holy Spirit where the other gospels don't. So Luke is uh, very well aware of what's going on. We also get that um, the story of Mary visiting Elizabeth and Mary's song of joy. So you don't have this song in the other ones that's uh, just outlined like this. Mary's song of joy, though, it kind of puts you in the, 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 the thought of Hannah's prayer. And if you go back to 1 Samuel chapter 2, uh, verses 1 through 10, that verse or that prayer that Hannah gave, it's really similar to Mary's song. Mary's song is followed by the birth of John the Baptist. Now, the birth of John the Baptist, it's a developing story. So at the beginning, we have this, this, this prophecy basically being foretold to Zechariah, telling him that they were going to have a son. Now, remind you, Zechariah and Elizabeth were both very old in age. They didn't have any children. Zechariah was a priest. He's in the temple doing his priestly duties. As he's sitting in there doing his priestly duties, going through the things that he needs to do, this angel of the Lord appears to him. Now, when this angel of the Lord appears to Zechariah, the angel of the Lord gives the information as to what's about to happen, that they're about to have this child. So I tell them, hey, we're going to have, you're going to have this child. This is what's going to occur. Zechariah in this vision, in this prophetic uh, 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 vision here, he stops talking. He becomes silent in the temple. He can't speak. When he goes out, the people are wondering why had he stayed in there so long? And they begin to look and try to get answers from him, but they notice that he's silent. When he's silent, they notice that he must have had a vision while he was inside of the temple, and he surely did. Now, Zechariah tells us that he was silent, and then when you get to the birth of John the Baptist, which is why I say it's a developing story, Zechariah, for the first time, it says he speaks. 
So inferring between this time, he was silent from the time he was in the temple and got the vision to the time John the Baptist had the child. He was writing everything down on the tablet as to what he was saying. And he didn't speak until after the baby is born. And Elizabeth said, hey, we're going to name this child John. And they began to say, well, listen, you don't have anybody in your lineage, anybody in your family whose name is John. So why would you name this, ch this child John? Typically, they would name children after people in their family or they would name them something to describe them. So, for instance, when we look at Esau, little red. So when we look at that, that names mean red because the baby came out in a red form. So when we talk about that. It, they, they gave names to describe the, the condition or the situation, or they gave names that were in the lineage of the family. John was not in the lineage of the family. So when they when she said, hey, I want to name him John, people looked at her crazy. So then they turn to Zechariah and they say, hey, she told my name is baby John. What what you going to name this child? Mind you, Zechariah hadn't spoke, so they're expecting now on this tablet for things to be written, but then it tells us that Zechariah speaks. So that's what we're talking about, um, the development of this birth here. His tongue was finally released and he could speak again. So after this um, occurred, we get Zechariah who then gives a prophetic song. So the song was prophetic in nature because it was talking about or, or it was foretelling what was going to happen now that John the Baptist was born. John came in the spirit of Elijah. Now, that's important for us to remember. John was not Elijah, but he came in the spirit of Elijah. In order for the prophecies to hold true, Elijah had to have a second coming before the Messiah. So with John the Baptist being in the spirit of Elijah and the angel of the Lord saying he was going to be born in the spirit of Elijah, that gives us the con uh, the, the, the concrete uh, expl explanation of what happened and how the Elijah prophecy piece was fulfilled. Now, uh, John the Baptist is the forerunner for Christ. And that part that I just mentioned about Elijah uh, coming before the Messiah, that's important because when we look at the transfiguration, that's what the disciples asked Jesus. They were like, okay, so we've seen Moses. Uh, you know, how is it that Elijah has come and went? And you hear that Elijah was supposed to come before you. And they said, he, and then Jesus told them, hey, well, Elijah came. Y'all didn't even know who he was. And he was talking about John the Baptist. So that is how all of that ties in together. Now, the interesting part about this that we don't get anywhere else, like I say, Luke gives us John the Baptist story about his development and his, his birth. And then it tells us about uh, a little bit as he's growing up, because it says that he lived in the wilderness. Now, there is information that says he lived in the wilderness, eating locusts and stuff like that. One thing that I've noticed about the wilderness is that usually when people are in the wilderness, they grow stronger in God. John the Baptist had to go and go to the wilderness because he needed to prepare himself for what he was about to face. He was living at a time where he was about to go and proclaim a man that people were waiting for, but they weren't quite ready for. So he had to come and set the stage. So in order to come and set the stage, knowing that he was probably going to face persecution, he was probably going to face some ridicule, and he was about to be preaching something that wasn't um, as known as much to the Jewish people as the rest of the world. See, when he came out teaching baptism, right? He came out and he's teaching baptism. Baptism was coming to the Gentiles, but it wasn't coming to the Jewish people. So John the Baptist had to come out and do something that was abnormal to the people of the Jewish, uh, uh, of the Jewish heritage, right? So as he's coming out there, he's, he's, he's going to the wilderness to get stronger in the Lord. We see Jesus, when he goes to the wilderness, he's tempted and he gets stronger in God. We see Israel as they're wandering in the wilderness. Some people say, well, they weren't getting stronger. Well, they were because they had to rely on God because they had nobody else that could satisfy their needs, that could do what they needed. They had to rely on God. So in the wilderness, there's actually the ability to get stronger. And that's what we find out with John the Baptist. He was getting more prepared 
uh, for the ministry and the work that he had to do. So the next difference that we see comes with the details on the birth of Jesus. Uh, and that's in chapters one through seven. So when we look at chapter two, verses one through seven, we notice that in this place, it says, in those days, Caesar Augustus issued a decree that a census should be taken of the entire Roman world. Now, this is what we always talk about around the nativity scene, right? Around Christmas, everybody talks about this story, uh, about the birth of Jesus. Well, this is where it's painted, is in Luke, because this is where it's talking about the census and he's having his journey, having to go back, talks about him, you know, being in the manger and everything else. It gives us a story about how... Um, got praise from the angels and witness from the shepherds. All of this is only found here in Luke in the developing phase that it's in. Luke is also the only one that talks really about Jesus circumcision at birth. Now, both John the Baptist and Jesus were circumcised on the eighth day, which was a Jewish custom. So that helps us to understand this Jewish lineage uh, when it talks about uh, Jesus and John the Baptist, and it shows that they are in the line of David. So it aligns all of this with the prophecy of the Messiah, because we find out the prophecy of the Messiah, what is coming from the lineage of David, who was all Jewish. And then this just helps us to add the fact that, hey, even Jesus was following the customs and the laws of the land. So we also get the presentation of Jesus in the temple. Now, it's the purification piece that's taking place in the temple. What happened due to the law of Moses? The firstborn people and the firstborn animals were dedicated to the Lord according to the law of Moses. So if you ever want to go back and look at what law that is, it's referencing, that's in Exodus chapter 13, uh, verses 2 through 13. So if you go back and look at Exodus 13, you'll see the law of Moses that I'm referring to. Uh, and these people were basically consecrated in the temple. Now, the animals, they were sacrificed, but the humans, they were basically dedicated to God. So they were set to serve God throughout their life. The Levites actually served in the place of all the firstborn males in Israel, as we see it mentions in the book of Numbers. So the only mentioning from this part, we, we, we see uh, in Matthew and Mark, we see Jesus born. But Luke is the only one that goes farther than when he's born. Like we get, in other books, we get he's born, okay, he's a full-fledged adult, and he's moving on. Well, in Luke points the picture of Jesus' childhood. So that's where we get the story of Jesus saying he's going, he was being about his father's business, right? If y'all remember that story where uh, Mary and Joseph, they were walking back, and they realized, man, Jesus not even with us. So they had to turn back and go back to go get him. And when they get him, they was, you know, a little upset about it. Like, why? You didn't follow us. Why are you back here doing what you want to do? And he's like, you know, I was about my father's business. But here's the, the, the part right here. And it's it's these small details in the text that we normally just read over. But they're really important because it helps us to bridge a lot of things. In the text, uh, and this is in chapter 2, chapter 2 and starting at verse 41 um but he said why are you searching for me he asked didn't you know i had to be about my father's i mean i would be in my father's house but they did not understand what he was saying to them so we're talking about mary and joseph they're still kind of lost like because they're their baby in their mind not realizing like hey he's doing god's work uh his father's work so he went down to nazareth with them and was obedient to them this is what I need you to understand here. Verse 51 points something out to us, right? It says he went down to Nazareth with them and he was obedient to them. But his mother treasured all things in her heart and Jesus grew in wisdom and stature and in favor with God and man. Now, it points out the fact that he was obedient to who? His parents. This right here points us to what Jesus is saying, to honor thy mother and thy father, right? So that's what we see in, 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 the, in the Ten Commandments. When we're looking at honor thy mother and thy father, we're talking about uh, having respect for your elders and all that kind of stuff like that. We see that Jesus is a person who lives what is written, right? So he's living his life according to what God has 
design. So he's honoring his mother, being respectful of his mother and his father by being obedient as a child. So when it comes time for his care and to tell people, hey, this is how you should act. This is the model that Jesus is setting, even as a little boy. So then it says he grows and he matures in, in, in stature and in wisdom. Remember when he, when his parents came back, he was sitting in there and he's talking to the teachers and they're teaching and he's giving answers. He's asking questions and they're all surprised about how wise he is. So he was already wise, but he's growing now as a man in wisdom. So that's where we get the advancement from in Luke versus the advancement from Jesus being a little baby, then into a man. So um, in chapter three, Luke provides us more details on John the Baptist. This is a book that's really focused on this development. The first chapter is devoted to telling the story of the early years of John the Baptist. It is here when we see the story of his birth being foretold uh, to Zechariah. I'm sorry, I'm going backwards. Uh, sorry, chapter three, we talk about John, but John the Baptist preparing the way. So in chapter three, there is really no unique contributions what we see in chapter three of Luke is similar to what we see in Matthew and in Mark. It talks about him going out there and baptizing the folks, telling the people they need to repent and be baptized. It tells us all those same stories in chapter three. So the next unique contribution actually comes in chapter number four. So when we get to chapter four, we notice that Jesus is rejected at Nazareth, right? So that's the unique contribution. It starts at verse number 16, though, and it goes all the way to the first clause uh, or the eight clause in chapter, I mean, in verse number 31. So this is a story of Jesus being rejected in Nazareth. He was in the synagogue and he was given the scroll to read uh, Isaiah. Once the people figured out who he was, they looked at him and started questioning, ain't that the son of Joseph? And Jesus I will say that he took offense, but he did begin to explain his statue compared to others. So Jesus began to talk about the previous prophets that the other people were praising so much and basically pointing a light like this saying, listen, what they've done, what they tried to do is nothing compared to what I have already done and what I will do. And the people got angry about it. They were upset because you got to understand these people were so gung-ho on their, their, their old prophets. They were so focused. They, their whole mind was on the Old Testament living, the old prophets, Moses. They were so stuck on them. They were their heroes. Now, here Jesus is, and Jesus is saying, listen, I'm better than your heroes. I'm going to do more than your heroes have ever done. So now the people are upset, and they try to drive Jesus out to the hill where he falls off a cliff. But Jesus just walks on through the people about his business because that wasn't his time to die. He, what he needed to do hadn't even really started yet. It hadn't even, you know, came to true fruition at this point. So that's what the unique part that Luke points out is that the prophet is rejected in his own city. We see that kind of stuff now. You get more support when you're a business owner, when you're an artist or whatever you are. You get more support from people who don't even know you versus the people who've grown up around you and been around you. And a lot of times, especially when I talk about our community and stuff like that, it's what we call the crab in the bucket mentality. It's like, yeah, we know you're talented. Yeah, we know you got a business, but why would I want to support you and see you elevate while I'm not? And that's the sad part about a lot of us is that jealous mind frame, that envy um, that's inside of us. We see all that kind of stuff going on now in Dallas and everywhere else. It's in every community. I mean, and it's not specific to any race. It happens in every race. It's just the human nature of envy and jealousy. Like that's something that we have to get out of. And like I said last Sunday, learn how to tell people congratulations and learn how to praise God for what he's doing for other people, not only you. So um, that's what happened, you know, by Jesus being rejected in his own city. They just couldn't take the fact that he was better than what they thought of their heroes. So the next difference for us in chapter, uh, in Luke, it comes in chapter seven. So in chapter 7, in the 11th verse through the 17th verse, we see Jesus um, come upon this dead person who's being carried out um, 
and he finds out that this is the mother's only son. He's dead. This is not mentioned in the other ones. The mother is crying. Jesus simply tells the mother, listen, don't cry. So he doesn't touch the man is what the text tells us. He says he touches uh, the thing that he's laying on. So when he touches it, he simply speaks and says, get up. And the man raised and he began to talk. Jesus gave him back to his mother. And of course, at this point, we're talking about a person who is dead, mama crying, everything else. Jesus has now raised him and told him to get up. He's back with his mama. So, of course, the word now is starting to spread. And that's what we see is that the word is spreading, that there's this great prophet who's going around. He's healing people. He's raising folks from the dead. And now Jesus' story is truly developing. We really get to see a lot of work now, miracles, parables, and everything else is coming to us in the book of Luke. So in chapter seven, before we even get too far, we see another story. And this is where the woman is spraying perfume. She's anointing Jesus' feet that we discussed last week. Now, the story is in chapter seven, verses 36 through 50, if you want to go and read it word for word by yourself. But this plays into Luke's theme of Christ's concern for women <clears throat> and for people who would normally be considered an outcast. Now, they could have been uh, an outcast as far as a moral outcast or a physical outcast, but they were looked at to the rest of the world and to the community as people that they just didn't deal with. But Jesus seen them and said, hey, you too can be my people. You too are worthy of being forgiven. You too are worthy of being sanctified. You too uh, are worthy of being uh, justified. So when we look at this, Jesus seen people who we would just, you know, forget them and say, those are my people. So that's the unique part there is about the woman who was a sinful woman uh, who Jesus said, hey, for what she's done, she's taking better care of me than you have. She's she showing me more love than you have. So she's forgiven. And that's what we see uh, Jesus concern for women. Now, when we get to chapter eight, verses one through three, we see another unique story. So we see a lot of stories in other gospels about Jesus and the disciples going here and going there, but this one is not in the other, uh, in the other uh, text. So chapter eight, verses one through three, it says, after this, Jesus traveled about from one village and uh, from one village, I'm sorry, from one town and village to another, proclaiming the good news of the kingdom of God. The 12 were with him and also who? Some women, some women who were cured with him um, of evil spirits and diseases, Mary called Magdalene, from whom seven demons had come out, Joanna, the wife of Chusa, the manager of Herod's household, Susanna, and many others. These women were helping to support them out of their own means. We don't see this story anywhere else. And it shows me Jesus has decided to go on a world tour. He's went on a tour through the towns and the villages with his 12, but not only the 12, but he's got some sisters with him. And it tells me that these sisters had some previous problems. This is the part that, you know, kind of drives me crazy when I see people being so misogynistic and being so uh, against women when it comes to the church and the church function. Jesus Christ used women often when it came to benefiting the ministry, when it came to moving forth the gospel, when it came forth to serving the people, there were women involved. Here we see not only women involved, but women who had demons, women who had issues, women who were filled with sin, but Jesus drove these demons out, changed their life around and said, you know what? I'm going. He didn't tell them to follow him. They followed because of what Jesus had done for them. And they follow out of their own means. So what that's telling me is this. These women are so strong that they were able to endure sin, endure demons, endure all of this they had. Jesus changed their life around and they realized 
This is the man I should serve. This is the man I should follow. And they helped out of their own pocket to make sure that the gospel was spread and went forth. So if a woman didn't help in the Bible, a woman didn't help the ministry and everything else, then I don't know. I don't know where else I can show you. Because we obviously see that Christ has a concern for women. Women have been downplayed historically, uh, and it's just inaccurate. They have always been of great value. Christ has always valued women and used them in his plans. Uh, and, and when we look here, we see they're helping in the ministry. So that was just my plug for all my women. I love y'all. I love y'all. Don't let nobody tell you that, you know, you can't be doing nothing in church or whatever else. Keep working. Keep serving God. We need you. In chapter 10, we see another unique part of uh, Luke, and this is the commissioning and the return of the 72. Now, I know some people are saying, what's the 72? We talk about the 12. We talk about the, 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 the 72. What's all these numbers? So the 72 were uh, these people who that were appointed by Jesus. And they were appointed to go into the nations two by two. So it was 72 of them, meaning that there was 36 pairs that went out into the nation. So they went out two by two. Uh, and what their job was, was to go into the towns before Jesus uh, came into the towns. And they were to go into the house. And if the people welcomed them in, they wouldn't reject them. They would go in, they would eat dinner with them. They would take whatever gifts that they were given and they would fellowship with them. Okay. If the people rejected them, they had to go out, you know, dust their feet off because that was a sign saying, hey, we're dusting the sin off of us and everything else. You know, that's 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 not going to work. And they would go out and leave the town or whatever. Now, these people, when they were going in there, one of the things that they had to tell them is that the kingdom of God is near them because Jesus was coming. And we understand Jesus was then doing what? Going to the cross to die, be resurrected. That is his kingdom. He is the king. So they were letting them know. Listen, the kingdom of God is upon you. Um, when they came back, they gave a praise report to Jesus saying that, listen, even the demons submit to us in your name. Jesus explained to them that he seen Satan fall like lightning from heaven and that he gave them the authority to trample on the snakes and the scorpions and to overcome all power of the enemy. Stop succumbing to the enemy. You have power over the enemy. You have power over your problems. You have power over evil. You have power over everything that's trying to stop you and deter you. Call on that power. It comes from God. Stop letting people deter you from what you're trying to do in life and what you want to do if you're right in God. Do it. Go for it. Stop second guessing yourself. Stop letting everything get you off track. Um, but after this story, you see the story of the Good Samaritan. So the Good Samaritan is consistently still used across different religions and everything else. It's become a household name for a person who is helpful um, to others, to their neighbor or whatever the case is. So that is just where we get the Good Samaritan story, which is right here in Luke and not in the other ones. So this same chapter also has the story of Mary and Martha. And that's in verses 38 through 42. So that's chapter 10 verses 38 through 42. So Martha is distracted, right? Y'all know how it is. People come to your house. You want to make sure it's cleaned up, make sure you got some food prepared, all that kind of stuff like that. So Martha's in there and she's focusing on all that. But Mary is sitting at Jesus' feet listening. So Martha begins to complain to Jesus about Mary not helping her. And Jesus has to point out that, listen, I came here. She's sitting at my feet. I'm talking this is the only thing that matters. Like all that cleaning up and trying to fix meals and all that, that's fine. But this is the only thing that matters. And that story, it, it plays multiple ways because it, it ought to show you that sometimes we got to let go of the focus of other stuff that we think matter and focus on God. Because if our mind stays on God and if our mind stays on the focus, on, on, the, on the focus of living a righteous life, of living a life, you know, that is, that is full of God, and less full of sin, things begin to fall in the path. If we focus on holiness, we focus on righteousness, things start falling right in your life. But we get so caught up in everything else that we forget about holiness. We forget about righteousness. We forget about God. And then he gets put on the back burner and we start seeing our life going to shambles because now we've let God go 
to pick up where we want in earthly desires. So always make sure that you're keeping your mind and your eyes focused on God because if you don't have God, you don't have anything. Everything in this world can disappear at the drop of a dime, but if you have God, that's always going to be with you. Your soul will have a perfect place. Your soul will have a place to go. So that's one thing that we have to learn to focus on is God. So in chapter 11, and that's where we'll end off tonight, it shows Jesus teaching on prayer. And like I say, this is where we'll end our session tonight. So when we go to chapter one, one day Jesus was praying in a certain place. When he finished, one of his disciples said to him, Jesus, Lord, teach us to pray just as John taught his disciples. So John taught his disciples, just so you'll know, John had his own disciples. He taught them. And if you remember the story, when John was in prison, he sent his disciples to come and ask Jesus as he's the Messiah. He's the one that's expected to come uh, because he was getting a little weary and wondering, like, is this the right man or am I just sitting in prison in vain? So he had to ask that question to send his disciples. So now Jesus' disciples saying, hey, teach us how to pray like John taught his disciples. So he said to them these words. He says, when you pray, say, Father, or our Father in heaven, hallowed be thy name. Thy kingdom come, thy will be done. Give us this day our daily bread. Forgive us our sins, for we also forgive everyone who sins against us. Lead us not into temptation. And then when we look at that, the Lord's prayer, but deliver us from evil one. That is what he's teaching them is the Lord's prayer. And I'm reading this out of the NIV, which they go and they change the words and everything else. But um, just in case some of y'all want to pass it on no Lord's Prayer. Yeah, I've been saying this since I was a little kid. But they changed the words up. But um, what we have to understand here, Jesus then goes and he explains it. He said, Jesus said to them, suppose you have a friend and you go to him at midnight and say, friend, lend me three loaves of bread. And a friend of mine on a journey has come to me and I have no food to offer him. And suppose the one inside answers, don't bother me. The door is already locked and my children and I are in bed. I can't get up and I can't give you anything. I tell you, even though he will not get up and give you the bread because of friendship, yet because of your shameless audacity, he will surely get up and give you as much as you need. So I say to you, ask and it will be given to you. Seek and you will find. Knock and the door will be open for everyone who asks receives. The one who seeks finds and to the one who knocks the door will be open. Which of you fathers, if your son asks for a fish, will give him a snake instead? Or if he asks for an egg, will give him a scorpion? If you then, though you are evil, know how to give good gifts to your children, how much more will your father in heaven give the Holy Spirit to those who ask him? Now, let me do this real quick and before we go, teach on this real quick. When Jesus is pointing out to them the Lord's Prayer, there is a couple things that's happening. The first thing is when we're praying, we are to give reverence to God as a higher being, as our Father who art in heaven. Now, the reason why is because although we have a close connection and close relationship with God, we still have to put some respect on his name. We still have to be respectful in how we approach God. So when we're looking at this and it says, our father, which art in heaven, is saying, hey, I recognize that you are my father. And I also recognize that you are in heaven, meaning that you are higher than I am. When it comes to respect, you are on a higher level than me. So I am saying this in reverence to your name. Hallowed be your name. That is the reverence that we're given. It says, your kingdom come, thy will be done on earth as it is in heaven. Again, still giving reverence. Now, if you notice something, most people when they pray, the first thing they do is they ask God for something. They don't say thank you. They don't give him reverence. They go straight to the, here's what I need. They go straight to the petition part. I need this. I want this. Lord, I can't live without this. In this prayer, it is very selfless, right? Not selfish, but self 
list because it says, give us each day our daily bread. But there's an interesting point about this. In this prayer, it is saying, hey, give us what you've already told you us that you're going to give us. And that's just our basic needs. It's not praying to be rich. It's not praying to be something that, you know, I want to be a doctor, but you only want to pay attention in school. It's praying for daily supplication, daily needs. Then it says what? It says, forgive us for our sins, right? And it's talking about forgiveness and, and forgiving us for trespassing while we're forgiving the others who trespass against us. That's a double whammy because what it's saying is, listen, we can't be forgiven until we forgive others in this prayer. So what Jesus is outlining, listen, you're praying for this, but you also need to make sure that you're taking some actions in your life. You're praying for forgiveness, but you still haven't forgave the people who did you wrong. That can't happen. That needs to change. That needs to turn around. Then he says, uh, deliver us from evil. He says, lead us not to temptation, but deliver us from evil. So when it said, lead us not into temptation, we know that God will lead us to temptation, but God will allow us to be tested. And he says, and deliver us from evil. So it's the evil, he's talking about the evil one. So deliver us from the snares of the devil. Deliver us from everything that he's trying to throw on us, that he's trying to uh, um, uh, 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 put us in or put us in a bind in. He's saying, deliver us from all of this. And this is what we got to understand here. When we're praying, our prayers need to start with reverence. Our prayers need to have some thanksgiving. Our prayers can ask for things. That's a petition. You can ask God for things, but you also need to be willing to do something. You know, that whole saying, pray and forget about it. That's great. But if your prayer requires you to have actions, you got to move. That's the reality of it. And then God, uh, Jesus paints this picture. He says, listen, when you pray, if it's in my father's will, he's going to give you what you ask for. He's going to give you what you seek. He's going to knock down that door that you're knocking on. He's going to make a way for you if it's in his will, because he's not the kind of father that if you're asking for something great, that he's going to come and do you wrong. That's what is, that's what's happening. So this is what Jesus is trying to explain to them is listen, trust in God, but know that trusting in God takes more than just saying, I trust you. It takes some actions. It takes some reverence. It takes some thanksgiving. It takes some knowing who he is and that he cares for you. So that's why he gives them the Lord's Prayer. And then he goes on and he brings back this whole parable thing to show the connection. So that is what he is. That's what Jesus has taught his disciples here in chapter 11. Uh, don't tend to go any further. So on the next week, well, not next week, week after Thanksgiving, then we will finish off the book of Luke talking about the unique features that it brings. And then we'll get into the John who, what, when, where, and why set that up. Now I will tell y'all when we get to John, John is a theological giant. It has a lot of theology in the book of John. So we probably won't get through it in um, one week or anything like that. It's going to take some time to develop the stories, to explain the theology, to explain the ecclesiology, to go through a lot of the stuff that's in the text um, so I don't want to just skip through John because John is such a powerful book. It's such a theological sound book. I don't want to go through it real fast. I want to break it down and explain it. So it will take us maybe two, three weeks to get through, but just bear with me. I promise when you get done with it, you'll know a lot more about John. You'll even look at John one and one, uh, with more, uh, confidence. So that is the biggest point of this is for us to read this Bible, to understand the Bible and to have confidence in the Bible, in God's word. So that is the point. That is the focus of why we're reading. If you have anybody that you need to add to the prayer list, make sure that you inbox us or send me a text message or whatever so we can add them. We want to make sure that we are praying for our family. And by family, I mean all God's people. Anybody that you need to lift up in prayer, make sure that's done. Make sure you join us uh, Sunday 10.50 a.m. is our start times when we start devotion. 11 o'clock is when the church service starts. Normally in and out by 45 minutes to an hour. So make sure you join us this Sunday. It's the Sunday before Thanksgiving. So we'll have, um, you know, our normal sermon and everything like that. 
and uh, a good time. I just pray everybody has a great Thanksgiving. If I don't uh, see you next week or anything like that, I'm just praying for you. I love you. Thank you for tuning in with us tonight. Um, I hope to see you back again with us to finish up, Luke. I would hate for you to only get a part of it and miss the other part. But we'll be back the Wednesday after Thanksgiving. Same place, same time. God bless you. Let us pray and dismiss. God, thank you for tonight. Thank you for this word that we receive. We thank you for loving us. Thank you for caring for us, God. Lord, we're coming to you because we know that you are a great God. And we just want to just ask us to continue to give our mind what we need to comprehend your word. Not to just hear about it, though, God, but to be doers of your word, to be teachers of your word, to be servants of your word. Father, we just thank you for giving us what we need in this text so that we can live our life effectively and efficiently. God bless the Morning Star Missionary Baptist Church and all of our guest members that have attended tonight. We thank you. We love you. We appreciate you. We celebrate you, God, in Jesus' name. And until we meet again, amen. Amen. Y'all have a wonderful night. I love you all. Can't wait to see you um, in person. Hopefully on Sunday we can get together. Uh, join us. We are actually in service, like in the building, and we are online as well. So join us. Look forward to seeing you. If you're looking for a church home, we are always with our doors open and our arms open, ready to love on you, hug you, and teach you. So come on and join you. Uh, God bless you all. You're welcome. Um, I take great pride or privilege uh, in teaching his word. So it's never anything for me. Thank you all for attending and listening. God bless you. Y'all have a great night.